So what we fundamentally have here is that economics is the scientific study of decision making. Why? Because making a decision means dealing with the problem of scarcity. What does scarcity mean? Okay, so scarcity, I got some notes here. Let me look on here. I want to make sure I don't, I don't, I don't mess you up in the head. So here's the idea in scarcity. The idea in scarcity is that people, individuals, organizations, and societies, they have goals. They have goals. You have goals, things you want to accomplish, things that you want, things that you think you need. Businesses have things that they want or need. Society has things that they want or need. And those goals have no limit at all. So our goals are unlimited. The goals that you have for your life are unlimited. Maybe you have a goal to buy a $50,000 car. Well, why buy a $50,000 car when you buy a $60,000 car? Why limit it at $50,000? If you can have anything you want, everything that you want, how long would that list be? Well, I promise you, you'd probably run out of time before you ran out of uh, things that you could put on that list of things that you want, goals that you have. And so our goals, okay, or our wants, let's put down here, our wants or our needs, the things that we want to accomplish or have for ourselves, they are unlimited, which means they are much larger than the resources that we have or the, what we call factors. They are greater than the resources, but we call them factors in economics. The resources or factors that are used to provide those goals or those wants. Okay, so for example, let's say that I want to eat lots and lots of pizza. I have a goal. I want to eat a thousand slices of pizza. Why do I want to eat a thousand slices of pizza? Because pizza is awesome. Well, to me it is. It's delicious. So when I take that first bite of pizza, it tastes so good that I want to experience that yumminess of pizza in perpetuity. I want to constantly be experiencing it. I want to be experiencing it all day long, every day, all the time. The problem is, is that my, uh, my stomach and my body cannot handle eating pizza all the time. At some point or another, I have to stop eating pizza because I have limited space in my body. Limited or we can say we have limited resources. And so the idea of scarcity is that wants are unlimited, but resources are limited. How many vacations would you go on if there was an unlimited amount of space, if there was an unlimited number of vacations, if there was an unlimited amount of time, if money was unlimited, if there was unlimited space on every cruise ship, unlimited space in, uh, in every amusement park in the world. But there's not unlimited resources. We only have so many, so much electricity. We only have so much water. We only have so much wood in this world. We only have so much plutonium. We only have so many atoms in the universe. The resources that we have are limited, even though the things that we want are unlimited. We could just keep making the list. And so that is what we call the problem of scarcity. Now, when we say problem, we don't really mean like, well, I have a flat tire and that's a problem. No, what we mean more is the fact that we just have a simple mathematical problem that we have an imbalanced uh, equa or it's, a, it's an inequality. We have an inequality here between what it is that we want and what we have, and the resources that we have to fulfill those wants. Okay, so I'm going to make a couple more notes here. So this idea of goals being unlimited, generally the main thing that we have that is unlimited that we want in economics, we call that utility. 
So the desire or really the, the, the fulfillment, so what I'm going to say here is utility is the satisfaction, satisfaction or uh, fulfillment of desire, of desire, okay? So we, you know, when, when you're happy, when you are experiencing happiness because you're at a, an amusement park with some friends, maybe you're on a roller coaster, what you are feeling while you're on that roller coaster is called utility or satisfaction or fulfillment. And in economics, utility is the final ending outcome of everything. You may think to yourself, no, money is the final ending outcome. No, you don't want money. I know you're thinking, yes, I do, I want money. I know that you want money, I want money too. But money is only the middle step to what you really want. The reason that you want money is because money will give you the stuff that makes you happy, so to speak. I'm not trying to get into like money equals happiness, but, I, but I'm saying money gives you the ability to buy the things that will then satisfy you. You need food, really it's the food that you want, but the money will help you get the food. You want to watch a movie? Well, you can go make the movie or you can buy the experience of watching that movie. Utility, okay? Another example, let me just give you, a, if, if I can, just go a little bit deeper. I really, I like sandwiches. I don't know if you like sandwiches, but I like sandwiches. I like a lot of different kinds of sandwiches, actually. I like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I like Italian subs, oh, hoagies. Man, there's some good stuff out there. Down in Boca, what's the name of that place? I'll tell you later, but there's a really good place down in Boca where you can get hoagies. They're delicious. But I like Italian subs. Publix has really good subs. So sandwiches, when you're hungry and you know that you're about to eat a Publix sub and you order it online or you go to Publix and you get the sub and you maybe, I like to get mayonnaise and mustard on my Italian sub. I know that may sound gross to some of you guys, but that's the way I like it. I like to have the lettuce and tomato on it. And when I pick up that sub and I'm looking at it, man, my brain is going crazy with chemicals over the excitement of what I am about to eat. Even just the anticipation of biting into that public sub is already providing me with satisfaction because I know that I am about to eat that public sub. And when I take that first bite and all of those mixtures of flavors, they hit my tongue and the nerve endings in my tongue, you know, like the taste buds, they signal, they send signals to my brain that just uh, cause the satisfaction and the, and the enjoyment in my brain to explode in happiness. And I'm like, man, this is such a good sub. I know you've said that to your friends before. Or maybe you were eating a cheeseburger. You're like, man, this is the best cheeseburger ever, right? If you have ever had that experience with food, what you were experiencing in that moment of gratification and satisfaction you are experiencing what we call utility in economics. And what we do is we don't separate one utility from another. When you're experiencing the gratification and satisfaction of eating a sub, or if you're experiencing the satisfaction of you know, an emotional movie, you know, or maybe you're watching an action movie and you're in suspense and you're like, whoa, that was awesome! You know, a big explosion or something like that. That in your brain gave you what we call utility. We boil all of it in economics down to the, to the very basic concept that we call utility. And, some, and in some things, you'll get more utility, and in some things, you'll get less utility. And what we're gonna do this semester is we're gonna understand that in different situations, whether it's microeconomics or macroeconomics, that there are different ways of ensuring that people get more utility, or in some cases, they will get less utility. So we're going to talk about utility in a very comparative sense. This is a very, very important concept in all of economics. And if you could 
have unlimited utility, you would, I promise you, that the amount of utility that you want is very simple. More. That's what you want. You want more utility. If somebody says, how much more? You would just simply say more. It's just how, who we are, how we are as humans, which is a little disappointing because sometimes what we do is we hurt other people while trying to get more utility. And in my opinion, this going over to normative here, I do not believe that we should be willing to hurt other people just so that we can have more utility. In fact, if we were concerned about other people experiencing utility at the same time we're concerned about ourselves experiencing utility, then we could make the world a better place. Okay, so, but here's the, the problem of scarcity is that you and all of the rest of us, what we really want is unlimited utility, okay? But the problem is, is that there isn't enough stuff in the world to give everyone unlimited utility. It's just not there. There's not enough lumber, there's not enough cars, there's not enough air conditioning, there's not enough light, there aren't enough tables, there aren't enough phones, there just isn't enough. There aren't enough movies, there aren't enough television shows, there's not enough food, there's not enough water. And when I say enough, what I mean is because we always want more, we will never stop trying to use up all the resources. Now, on a normative level, we have to be very careful about that because the resources in this universe are very limited. We know that they are limited. This is not subject to debate. The fact that resources are limited is positive economics. What we should do about the limited resources, that is a subject of normative economics, okay? Now, we're gonna focus mostly on the positive economics, but the fact of the matter is resources are limited. Okay? Now, in economics, we discuss or focus on four, or excuse me, well, there's four, but we're going to only focus on three of them. Uh, we call them the factors of production. You're going to want to write this down. The factors is the last thing we're going to talk about right here. The factors of production. Okay? The factors of production, there's three main factors of production. We call them, in economics, these are the words for economics. The words could be different in other subjects. And they're kind of, economics has been around for a while, and so they're really sort of simple words. But they mean something very specific. The three factors of production, what we use to satisfy our utility, are the three factors of production which we call land, labor, and capital land, labor, and capital. Now, most textbooks, and I agree with them, um, and I have taught for a long time, but I've, I've noticed that I don't really focus much on it. They indicate a fourth factor of production, which we call entrepreneurship. So if you want to write down entrepreneurship, that's fine. I'm going to write it down here. Factor of production, entree, E-N-T-R-E, then P-R-E-N-E, you are ship, S-H-I-P, entrepreneurship, okay? Now, let's talk about what these four are. But again, I, wanna fo I want you to know that we are really only going to focus on these three factors of production. So when I say the three factors of production, I'm talking about land, labor, and capital. All right, so what is land? Very simply. Land is any naturally occurring, naturally occurring resources. When I say resources, when I say naturally occurring, what I mean is this, trees. Trees are naturally occurring here on earth. If people weren't here, there would probably still be trees. Grass is naturally occurring. Air is naturally occurring. I mean, the air that we breathe normally outside. I'm sure that there are some gases in laboratories that are invented by scientists 
we would call that something else. But the air outside, that is naturally occurring. Wind, wind is naturally occurring. Sunshine, naturally occurring. The planets, naturally occurring. Rock, naturally occurring. Anything that is naturally occurring. Animals, a cow, for the most part, is naturally occurring. Fish are naturally occurring. And so all of those things that I just said, anything that is naturally occurring, we refer to in economics as land, labor. We're just gonna, we're gonna say any people resource, any people resource. So we're basically talking about anything regarding Generally, I'm going to say human beings, but if, if there were aliens from, you know, some other planet living here, then we would include them in labor. Any sentient resource, okay? So, my knowledge as a professor, that is labor. My effort, what I'm doing right now by making this video and explaining economics, that is a labor resource. When a person lifts a whole, uh, you know, a big bag of flour. They're exerting their strength and they're, and they're burning calories as they carry that bag of flour. That is labor. When a person is hired to go sit at a computer and type and, and create a computer program, that person, their time is labor. So any people resource or any human resource is labor. And that's a very important part of organizations and also a very important part of societies. We, uh, we, we use labor resources frequently. In fact, you're probably taking this class right now so that you can get a college degree so that you can go get a job or start a business and make some money, right? That makes you and what you're doing right now a labor resource. Okay, so anything involving humans, their effort, their time, their knowledge, their skills, their abilities, all of that is what we refer to as labor in economics. Last thing, capital. Capital is the, what I call, this is my definition, is the combination, the combination or the result slash result of land and labor, land and labor. Here's what I mean. Let's go back, I don't know, thousands of years or something, and there's some guy, you know, there aren't many humans, let's say there's maybe a couple thousand humans on the whole planet, right? And um, he wants to break open the shell of a, of a turtle. Okay, he wants to break open the shell of a turtle and cook it and have turtle soup or something like that, right? Well, he catches the turtle, so he is labor, all right? So this meal that he's about to have, he is, he is involved, or maybe he gets some of his friends to help him catch this turtle, all right? That's labor resources. The turtle that they actually catch is land because it's naturally occurring. Maybe they used a vine to set a trap for the turtle, and that vine itself is land because it's naturally occurring. But now he wants to break open the, um, the turtle shell uh, of the turtle that he's caught and killed. So let's say he takes a rock and tries to smash at it. And the rock is just not working very well. Um, and that rock that he's using is land. But he gets this idea. He's, he's a young, budding uh, uh, physicist, okay? And he feels like... If he can swing the rock faster and at a longer arc, he might be able to, to provide more force and break open the shell of this turtle, right? So, he gets a stick, land. He gets another rock, land. And he gets another vine, land. He takes the rock and sticks it in, in, a, in kind of a nook on the end of the stick. Then he wraps the vine around it to attach the rock to the stick. 
and creates a hammer, a very, you know, sort of a, a, a basic hammer. But that hammer, that stick with the rock tied on with the vine is not naturally occurring. That hammer is not naturally occurring. It took the man, the labor, to take naturally occurring resources and manipulate them in such a way that he created a tool which we refer to as capital. That hammer is now capital. And he can now swing that hammer as hard as he can, as fast as he can, without hurting his hand. Because when he held the rock, it was hurting his hand. But now with the hammer, it's taken away a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, the force. And he can just keep pound, 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 pounding at that, at that turtle shell until it breaks open and he can make turtle soup. Or I don't know, I'm just making stuff up here. Okay, but here's what you need to understand, is that capital is not naturally occurring. This marker, you can't go, find, go pick one of these off of the tree. This marker was created out of natural resources by people who came up with the design for this marker. And so this marker is capital. This whiteboard is capital. This uh, stool right here, this, this is capital. This is not naturally occurring in the environment. And so most of the stuff around you that you live with is capital. And what we do is we accumulate capital in our lives to make our lives easier and better and allow us to accomplish things that we weren't able to accomplish before. If we need shelter from a storm, if it starts raining and lightning or maybe there's a hurricane or, or an ice storm, if we have to rely only on land for shelter, we're going to have to go get under a tree or find a cave somewhere or something like that. Or maybe, maybe grab a, a big you know, dead bush and pull it over the, the door to the cave. But if we want really good, protective shelter from that storm, we're going to need capital. We're going to, take, we're going to chop down a bunch of trees and we're going to stack them up and we're going to take some mud and we're going to keep, you know, we're going to uh, bind them together, get some vines or even make better than vines, we can make rope out of fibers from plants, right? That is capital, okay? And so what we do in this world in order to deal with the problem of scarcity is we collect land, labor, and capital, put them together, and use them to satisfy our utility. And that is what the study of economics is all about. We study, we scientifically study how individuals, organizations, and societies figure out how to answer these questions and satisfy their utility to achieve their goals by manipulating their land, labor, and capital in different ways so that they get the best outcome possible. The best outcome possible. And now this last one down here, well, what is entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship, the way I believe it, the way I understand it, is that entrepreneurship is the creative ability to bring together land, labor, and capital in such a way that you are able to help satisfy utility for other people, okay? And so this is the idea. So if you are thinking about, you know, you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to start a business and make a lot of money, well, you're never going to make a lot of money as an entrepreneur unless you can bring together land, labor, and capital in a really good or the best way to help other people satisfy their utility. And that's when they'll start handing you money. They'll say, hey, you're really good at satisfying utility. I'm going to give you some money. I'd rather buy it from you than make it myself. That's entrepreneurship, okay? All right, what we're going to do in the next segment now, hopefully now you have a pretty good understanding of economics. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about whether you are in a microeconomics class or in a macroeconomics class.